Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to today's presentation. My name is Paige Thomas. I am a senior program specialist here with Nashville. Today, we will be uh, listening to the presentation titled Exploring the Need for Cultural Consideration in Youth Crisis Care. Before we begin, we would like to mention that this is a safe and friendly space for positivity and productivity. There are a few housekeeping items I'd like to quickly go over. This presentation is being recorded and the recording link slides in the letter of attendance will be sent via email to everyone who attended today. This information will also be available on MHA's and NASHBA's website, as well as NASHBA's YouTube channel. Please use the chat pod to share your name and state, ask questions, or share information with the group that pertains to the presentation. Closed caption can be viewed by clicking the CC at the bottom of your screen or clicking the link in the chat pod to view in a separate window. We will also have an ASL interpreter who is spotlit on everyone's screen. After the presentation ends and you leave this platform, a brief survey will show in your browser. Please take a few moments to share your comments and thoughts about today's presentation. We would like to give a special thanks to SAMHSA for sponsoring this presentation, and thank you again for joining us. I will now turn this over to Jackie Zimmerman, Public Education Associate from Mental Health America. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, Paige, and welcome everyone. We are thrilled to have you joining us here today. I am the Public Education Associate at Mental Health America's National Office, and I'll be helping to moderate today's webinar. Today's webinar is exploring the need for cultural consideration in youth crisis care, and we're joined by Dr. Patrice Berry and Dr. Frederica Brooks Davis. Just a reminder, this is the fourth webinar in our youth series that's sponsored by SAMHSA. And so if you haven't seen our previous webinars, we encourage you to go back and watch those as well. And we can go to our next slide. For today, we just want to remind everyone that this webinar is hosted, um, sponsored by SAMHSA, but the views, policies, and opinions expressed are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect those of SAMHSA or HHS. We are so excited to present this information to you today. And just a reminder to post your questions, comments, resources in the chat. All of the questions I'll be keeping an eye on throughout today's session. And then when we have some time at the end for Q&A, our speakers will go through those. So I will now hand it off to our speakers. Dr. Patrice Berry and Dr. Frederica Brooks-Davis. Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Frederica Brooks-Davis and I have the pleasure of introducing myself as well as my colleague, uh, Dr. Patrice Berry. Uh, we certainly want to thank both SAMHSA and Mental Health America for the invitation to um, present to you this afternoon. Um, I, again, my name is Dr. Brooks Davis, and I am the founder and executive director of the Restoration Center located in Largo, Maryland. It is a training facility also for our graduate students uh, majoring in uh, social work, psychology, and counseling. And then I also provide consultation to faith-based institutions on the development of lay and or paraprofessional services. Please. Next, we have our doctor. Oh, she <laughs> has a PsyD in clinical psychology and is licensed in Virginia, specializing in treating children and teens. She has a history of working in juvenile justice and residential hospitals, home and school based community services, and outpatient treatment settings. She is the owner of Four Rivers. Psychological Services, LLC, and she's the author of Turning Crisis into Clarity, How to Survive or Thrive in the Midst of Uncertainty. The objectives for today's workshop include uh, exploring the benefits of viewing individuals through a cultural lens, describe ways culture can impact youth who have a serious mental illness during a crisis incident, and then to identify how spirituality or culture can be a protective factor during a crisis. 
So what is culture? How do we define culture? So first, let me state that we are certainly utilizing a definition provided by the Office of the Surgeon General. With that being said, as clinicians, providers, pastors, lay leaders, parents even, um, we want to encourage you to know that it's always important to understand cultural through the lens of the person that you're working with. But here for a general definition, culture looks at the values, the norms, and beliefs shared by a group, family of origin, religious community, neighborhood, and society. And so when I talk about why, why is it important for us to even break this down to the individual versus just looking at the group at large? So let's say, for example, I'm African-American, of course. I'm African-American. That's how I identify. I'm originally from South Carolina. I currently live in Maryland. I'm a Christian, and I have been a member of two different religious denominations. So you can see within that, as far as my culture is concerned, it is comprised of everything I just mentioned. Therefore, how I view life, my lens has been informed by that, along with the values and beliefs of my respective family. We're going to explore the benefits of viewing individuals through a cultural lens. So what are some of those benefits and why is that important? Number one, individuals are affirmed. When we as service providers, whether it's lay or professional, or if it's familial, if it's a member of your family, when we take the time to know and understand the individual through their culture, they are affirmed. It lets the individual know that the person sitting across from me cares about who I am, but cares, cares about how I'm showing up in this room, in this space. Also, there's opportunities for misdiagnosis, overdiagnosis, or underdiagnosis. They are reduced. So it mitigates those opportunities for a misdiagnosis. We know based on the literature that there are some psychological um, evaluation measures that are often used. And if we do not understand culture, then when we read a number, we may misinterpret that based on the number alone versus looking at that number within the context of that person's culture. So an example of that might be um, in some personality assessments, an African-American male, it may appear to be um, Dr. Whaley has done some research in this area, Arthur Whaley, but it may appear to be that an African-American male on the MMPI, that male may be over-exaggerating or believe that he, in fact, um, you know, the, the facilitator or the, the evaluator may believe that this person is really citing some things that may not be true, when in actuality, that may be their experience. For example, going into a store and being followed. One person might see that as, okay, this person is exaggerating. Perhaps there is some psychological explanation for this, that they feel that they are being followed. When in actuality, when we look at the data for that particular population, for that culture, that may be their lived experience, which now moves it from being something of a psychological nature to it's something that is this person's experience as a result of his or her lived experience that we need to take into consideration. So again, if we understand the culture by which this person lives and we understand their lived experience, it reduces opportunities for us to misdiagnose, overdiagnose, and in some ways underdiagnose. So for years, the data suggests, the literature was suggesting to us as mental health professionals that uh, women of color often were underdiagnosed when it came to depression. But that was not a diagnosis that we often saw or received when in all actuality, depression shows up differently based on culture. Symptom presentation, all of that shows up differently based on our culture. And then identification of resources are more closely aligned with the presenting concern. So culture, where does this factor, how does culture play into providing a list of resources? How many of us, if we are working with persons, be it professionally, through lay, 
or a family member that we see that something is going on, we just arbitrarily say, well, have you heard of this location? Have you heard of this organization? Without understanding the culture before we made the referral. And so again, back to how we are affirmed. So an example of that might be um, persons who they, from a, a socioeconomic perspective, they may not have health insurance. So if we are providing a list of uh, referrals, we want to make sure that we don't provide a list of referrals that only lists places that accept health insurance. Why? Because for that person, it would not be uh, beneficial to them. Also, we would want to know culture as it pertains to different ethnic groups. As uh, when it comes to working with men and women, some cultures and ethnic groups have various um, beliefs or norms around that. We want to make sure we are understanding of what those are so that if it is not appropriate to be seen by someone of the opposite gender or based on age and how that culture values an elder, we will be able to make referrals based upon that and that align with whatever that presenting concern might be. Culture and the client. So culture also informs symptom presentation. And what do we mean by that? Uh, we know, and there's um, more research coming out now in the literature about symptom presentation with African-American women. My practice primarily focuses on uh, persons of color, but we happen to see quite a bit of African-American women who present um, in our practice. And so in that, we know that oftentimes um, passion and the way in which a person speaks may be misunderstood as anger. We also know that some of our adolescents present with being upset and angry when, particularly when we're talking about adolescent males, it's not necessarily that they're angry as much as depression may show up in that way. And you compound that based on where that person lives. So if that is a young person who lives in a community where mental health is not something that is embraced, but it's a stigma, and they live in an urban area where um, death is around them more often than, say, maybe in some of our rural or suburban neighborhoods, and then you take this person to school and during COVID, they were not able to have assistance from their teachers to know and understand their homework because either their parents may not have been able to help them for a number of reasons. Um, it could have been that they were working and they didn't have the time to sit at the computer with their particular student. For some of our um, communities where we have this multi-generational, it could have been a grandparent and that grandparent learned math one way and now their grandchild is learning a different way. And so all of these factors weigh in in terms of how we present when we come into the room. So it's important when we first meet with persons that we take the time to get to know their story. What do they believe? What do they value? And this is true for our young people, particularly because in this day and time, our young people's values uh, may differ from those of their parents' generation. And so as a result of that, we want the young person, regardless of age, to feel affirmed, understand what they believe, of course, take it within the appropriateness of their age, but then also look at the culture of their parent, their home, their environment. It also informs our, their attitude towards seeking treatment. Um, so I recall that there was a time in which I was asked to work with a hospital in the Washington um, metropolitan area. And this particular hospital was working with women who were diagnosed with breast cancer. The women were not coming in for treatment. And so the hypothesis or the thought was that these women had a mental health um, concern. And so my job was to go into the homes to diagnose them. Well, what we found was that it wasn't that these women had mental health concerns. It really was more around attitudes related to seeking treatment, but then some of it was just they needed to work. So though they may have had a double mastectomy, though they may have had this diagnosis of breast um, cancer, 
the reality in this situation was they may have been the only one working in their household and they needed to pay bills. So their treatment, the lack of showing up had nothing to do with a mental health concern. They had everything to do with one, um, the attitude towards seeking treatment because number one, uh, one of the placements where persons could go to seek mental health services in the community was a place that the community did not embrace. And this is again where culture and understanding culture comes into place. So when they found out this particular place was offering mental health services, the community was like, no, we don't support it. We don't believe in it for various reasons. So again, now after the fact, learning of this information, the hospital had information to make informed decisions about moving forward. So that's the same on a macro or micro level. Compliance with treatment recommendations. Um, so when we're working with our young people, it is very important for us to know and understand um, how you are valued within their respective community and culture. What is the culture of that the parent? So in other words, if you're working with someone and an adult is in fact the abuser. And in this particular community, the thought is that the adults are often right and children are not. You would want to know that when you are looking at what your treatment recommendations would be. Because if you're not careful, you could in turn cause a young person to be in a unhealthy situation by virtue of um, placing them in front of the person who's abusing them or who's not treating them right. So let's take with that same example, if you're working with a young person and let's say the abuser is a parent. But in this culture, within this community, um, the seniors, the elders are the ones who provide wisdom and guidance. So it's not that you can't refer them to someone else. You just have to understand within that cultural context, who would be the next best person for that young person? Not the abuser, but perhaps a grandparent, perhaps an elder who's not related or respected within that neighborhood, within that community. So this is why it's important to know that. It's equally important to know because if you're working with a child and the parents are separated or they're divorced, it's important to note um, who gets the final say. So we understand what the laws of the land may say, but what happens within that culture? So if the male, if the father has the final say in that community, then it's going to be important to partner with the father and the mother so that when you develop a treatment plan, a course of action, the father is included. Because if not, then it may seem, it may, you may appear to be disrespectful, number one, because you did not include the father, but also the parent or the child can uh, appear to be disrespectful and it would not be healthy across the board. And then there are some coping strategies. So we know that religious coping is one of those strategies that we use when we're working with um, clients. And so for those who desire to have religion or spirituality incorporated in their treatment, then that could be a strategy that's used. Uh, we do integration in, in the work that I do, and it is important to know the difference between religion and spirituality, and also to know, are they being used interchangeably within that particular culture? Now, we say, again, don't look at it broad. Each family is going to look at it differently. So ask and work with the youth as well as the parents to identify and define what spirituality and religion means to them so that if you incorporate it as a coping strategy, that it is consistent with their respective beliefs. Culture informs the accuracy of the diagnosis, the treatment recommendations, and payment for services rendered. And so what we're saying here is that if, um, if you're a clinician working with a client it is important that you look at not just the etiology when you're looking at the DSM, but you're also looking at the culture of the person that's seated before you. So you're looking at it from a broad context, but you're also looking at it within their respective context and community. In doing so, it will help you reach a more accurate diagnosis 
It will also help you identify treatment options that are available. And then in some communities, payment for services rendered, uh, for some communities, they operate on barter. If you're in a, a, a rural area where a lot of people are growing vegetables, fruit and vegetables from the land, they may bring that in and say, I can't pay you, but I want to provide you with uh, a head of collard greens or some strawberries, things of that nature. So uh, we want, we understand what our ethical model, model states. We also want to make sure that we are doing things that are culturally sensitive and understanding that there may be a myriad of ways for services to be paid for um, based upon the respective culture of the person that we're meeting with. Ways culture may impact mental health is cultural stigma. I mentioned that before. So even within religious and some spiritual circles, they may believe that mental health is not real. That if you have a problem from a mental health perspective, it then means that something's wrong with you, um, something's wrong with your relationship with your higher power. So we then need to understand from a um, stigma perspective, how is it perceived within that respective community so that we also don't feed into that stigma. Understanding the symptoms that exist, um, how that may present itself. I've kind of given some examples earlier. Community support. So with communities of color, um, looking at one of the things that is across the board oftentimes is community is valued more so than the individual. And so in that, if you know that up front for that particular community and those clients that you're seeing, if when they talk about their community, you may find that persons they're calling their auntie and their uncle are people in the community. They're in their churches. There are people who are sitting on the corner um, watching the neighborhood. So it may not be biological, but the blood doesn't matter because the culture, that community values that. And then I've already talked about resources, what resources we use and making sure that those are um, culturally aware and they are um, consistent with the client or the youth or family that you're working with. The intersection of culture and COVID-19, COVID-19 exacerbated the challenges that children, adolescents, and their families were facing prior to. So when we talk about that, what do we mean in particular? Access to health care. Some of this, those of you who are familiar with social determinants of health, access to health care was one that was exacerbated. So those persons who already did not have health insurance, now they were not able to seek services finances for many persons, if they were not able to go to work, particularly early in 20, then it impacted them. Trauma was something that was difficult. So oftentimes for communities of color before COVID-19, they were already trying to face trauma, uh, race-based trauma, things of that nature. And then uh, in the African-American community, our community had more deaths related to COVID. And then you weren't able to um, bury your loved one, honor that loved one, celebrate the life of that ancestor um, after they transition, which again brought on more trauma. So we still have persons now who are really just trying to deal with the fact that they weren't able to see their loved one, let alone celebrate their life. And then coping with something, back to my point again, given just the one example for our young people who grandparents may have left and gone to the hospital and did not return. And as a result of that, it's been difficult for them to cope um, with the loss of loved ones. So again, um, the issues and concerns already in the community were exacerbated during uh, COVID-19. Now we're gonna turn this over to Dr. Barry. All right, thank you so much. And I just wanted to reiterate, and so talking about the impact of culture during a crisis incident with a youth, talking about the importance of getting to know their story. When a youth is in crisis, they you, you want to connect with them and they're often in pain. And I wanted to show, I wanted to share a example. Um, and so I've changed the name, I've changed the different um, demographics for this, but we're gonna talk about 14 year old Fatima, a Pakistani American teen that I assessed within the juvenile justice system. 
they were referred for a psychological evaluation by their probation officer. And the probation officer was concerned with the teen and the family not adhering to certain treatment recommendations. And in talking with the family, in talking with the teen, we realized that the system, the juvenile justice system, they weren't allowing the family to have an interpreter. And the mother, she seemed as though she understood what was going on, but she didn't. She was not understanding, and it was really embarrassing for her. And she really needed somebody to be in the room to interpret. And that was one of the recommendations that I ended up making to the system was that to be able to either the system could provide the interpreter or there was an adult family member that was that was willing to, to, to do it as well. Because sometimes systems, they lack certain resources, but culturally this was something that was really needed in order for them to get the most out of family therapy and also out the, the teen to really be able to get a better understanding of, of, of what was going on. During our meeting, we also realized that the teen had experienced a trauma and that was in and that was impacting them spiritually. They were they are Muslim and they felt that they were going to be blamed and shamed within their religion. And in having a conversation with the family, the family disagreed with this. And this wasn't something that they were even aware that the teen was struggling with. And this was a major trigger for thoughts of self-harm and other major negative thoughts for this individual. And so being able to address the spiritual issue, the cultural language issue that was a, that was happening within treatment sessions, being able to address the shame, those were all very important things and creating that safe space where that where that teen could feel heard and understood and in getting to know someone and meeting for that very first time, I like to give choice. So I like to let people know that if there's anything that they're not ready to, to talk about during that first session, because sometimes we get so wrapped up in the fact that I have to get all of these questions done this very first session so that I can arrive at a particular diagnosis and so that we can do all of these different things. But sometimes the way that that comes across for youth, especially youth that come from marginalized backgrounds, they might need a slower pace. And so being able to just let them know if there's anything that they don't want to discuss during that very first session, because as a, as a provider, that gives me information. So anything that's kind of too sensitive, that's too touchy, because I also, I don't want them to open all of these wounds and they're already in crisis. And then I don't know if they have the tools and resources to cope with what we've just opened up. And so next slide. In researching for this presentation, can we do the next slide? Because we're going to talk about the mental health crisis in teen girls and the fact that the CDC released this and I have um, a link, so I have the resource listed and it was a media release, I believe from February of this year. They released some data from 2011 to 2021. There's been an increase in mental health concerns in youth in general, but in particular with girls that we've seen a significant increase in depression in, in girls. And in looking at the, the research, they, they showed that, that girls were reporting 60% more um, incidents of, of violence. They were, in, they were reporting more sadness and that there was an increased risk for thoughts of self-harm and then also suicide. And they're um, being able to 
be aware of this information so that when I'm working with somebody and they're talking about feeling hopeless and helpless and they're not feeling connected, they've experienced a trauma, maybe even at school, being able to be aware that this is something that we're seeing as trends. And the goal is to help equip all youth, but especially girls with the strategies and tools that, that they need to be able to, to cope. And then also having safe, safe places for them to, to connect. And that moves right into the next slide where we talk about the crisis of connectedness in teen boys. And this comes from the work of Dr. Wei. Uh, she has interviewed I think hundreds of boys from various cultural backgrounds. And something that she realized is that as boys move into late adolescence, there starts to be this more stereotypical where they are feeling the pressure that boys don't cry, that that they're um, that they're gay, if they want positive relationships, and that they're getting away from having close, intimate, intimate relationships. And that really it's increasing feelings of loneliness and sadness, and that teen boys are feeling more and more disconnected, and that we need to find ways to safely have them connect, and for the adults, and then also for other people to help support them building healthy relationships. Because having relationships that are emotionally close, that that can really help foster not only mental health, but also physical health as well, that individuals that because feelings of loneliness like and all of those things that it, it can have an impact on your physical body as well. And, um, and that boys report this pressure to man up and they have this fear of having these, these close relationships, but it's something that they desperately need. And so finding safe ways to have them link up and connect to be able to foster healthy relationships is incredibly important. And at the, I think it's youth.gov, there are different videos if people are interested in learning more about this topic. Um, she has some different videos available there that dive deeper into this topic. Next slide. So why is connectedness important? And so there are things that can help protect youth um, because in our world, people are going to experience negative things. We, we can't protect people from everything, but there are ways to build resilience. There are ways that, that when a crisis happens, individuals that have academic achievement and are doing well in school, that that can be a protective factor. It can also be a warning sign if I see someone who was previously doing very well in school, all of a sudden they're really struggling academically. Sometimes that can be a sign that there's something going on with them. And when people are working with youth, knowing that when they're not okay, they won't always come and say that they're not okay. You'll often notice it with a change in attitude. They quit all the sports they were doing. They, you know, just completely switch friend groups that often you can tell by their behaviors. They won't always say it. Um, I am glad because there are some youth that will go to their parents and family and say that they want therapy, that they want counseling. And I think continuing to break mental health stigma with getting help and support, that's something that's really important to me personally, because People, the way that I like to talk about it is that therapy, that it's really when the skills and tools I have are no longer working and I need some extra help and support. It's not because I'm crazy or because of some other that we really have to break that stigma that people go to therapy because there's something wrong with them. And so in looking at these protective factors, already having a high self-esteem 
that that can sometimes be a protective factor in the middle of of crisis having emotional intelligence so having the ability to regulate those emotions having coping skills having problem solving skills being able to understand my emotions and the emotions of others that can be really helpful in the midst of a crisis and that's where i can see with youth in crisis, sometimes people have a skills deficit. And that's the way that I describe it to parents as well sometimes, because sometimes parents can really struggle when their teen is being really, when the attitude and there's like a lot of behaviors going on, but we have to get to what's under it. And what's under it doesn't excuse what's happening, but it does just help me understand because somebody that's struggling emotionally that is very different from a purely behavioral issue. And in a lot of my work, um, I really see that it can be untreated anxiety. It can be undiagnosed mental health conditions that, 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 that have been masked for a long period of time. And now we need to find ways to get this teen some additional skills and some additional help and support. And then being engaged and connected in school with peers, athletics, having a job, religion, or with your culture. And so finding healthy, positive ways to connect and having those so social groups. So um, I truly believe that we were made to live in community and that in this community that we can really help be connected. And often teens, they're, they're finding a lot of connection online. And some of that online connection can be, can be isolating and there can be some pitfalls. And um, cause I often check in with, with youth I'm working with on their social media use. What, what platforms are they really drawn to? Is this more of a distraction or is this a positive coping skill? And then also with um, cause teens, they have a developing brain and they are prone to impulsiveness to do something without thinking. And so in working with teens and with parents talking about, okay, how do we handle it when they make, when they do something that's not appropriate, when you find out that they're doing something that they're not supposed to do, let's talk about how, how to handle it so that we're not overreacting and versus responding to whatever just happened or to whatever we need to address. And I always come from it from a place of safety, that it's about safety. And um, that sometimes it's not because they're bad or because sometimes there can be a lot of blaming and shaming language that's used. And so looking at ways to create some safety, especially if people are connecting a lot online. Next slide. There we go. And so the CDC defines connectedness as a sense of being cared for, supported and belonging, and can be centered on feeling connected to family, school, or other important people and organizations in their lives. And so let's talk about why connectedness is so important. Because one of the ways that connectedness can be positive for youth is that it can also, like I said earlier, it can serve as that protective factor when somebody is having a mental health crisis, when they are experiencing maybe their first breakup or a new stressor. And I also think teaching validation, ways for communities to validate, and that validation doesn't mean approval. So I can validate something without saying that. Um, and so I can validate that my teen is, is having a lot of emotions and that there's a lot going on without approving the behavior that they're currently exhibiting. Because when you connect with the emotion, that's what often helps people see, feel safe, seen, and, and heard. And that's something that I think we all really long for. And that connectedness, feeling, having those safe places to connect with family. And for some people, their family, it's not a place that they feel connected to, and it might not be a safe place for them. Um, especially, so I work a lot with LGBTQ youth, 
And sometimes they come out to me and they can't come out to their family because they're concerned about would they be kicked out or would they um, start to experience different negative things with within their family being rejected. And so um, sometimes you have to, to let the client take the lead. And so the youth, they they might just be able to, to have that safe place to fully be their authentic self in that session, but they might have to, they might not be able to do that at home. But then I would wanna help that youth find safe spaces, maybe at school, maybe within a um, affirming faith community. And, and then if it's really, you know, like, and then finding safe communities um, offline as well because like I mentioned earlier online it's nice especially if I have like a niche um, so a client that's struggling to connect with people in their area but if we can find local people that they can connect with in person it is just just different and finding ways for people to get you know off of the devices off the phones um finding healthy activities and mentoring. And then if my client is struggling academically, there might be an undiagnosed learning issue. They might need some tutoring that sometimes we quickly, especially um, parents, quickly think it's laziness that the child just won't do the thing. And sometimes there might be something that's getting in the way. They might be struggling to ask for help and support, and they might need some academic support or some, some tutoring. Uh, let's head to the next one. All right, and so in when a person is in crisis, it's really important to speak slowly and clearly, expressing empathy and compassion. And I wanna make sure that my emotion stays calm, that I'm not reactive so that if somebody comes to me in crisis, and this is something that I teach my parents to fake, because as a parent, one of the scariest things is for your child to come to you and tell you that they don't know if they, if they want to live, that they're having some really intense negative thoughts. And, but as a parent, I need to know this. And so sometimes they have to, I, I teach the parents to just breathe and then to cry in the clock or like to, but don't freak out in front of the child because I need that teen. I need that youth to, to know that the people in their life, that they're able to, to handle, they're able to, to support them emotionally and to be there for them. Because often that triggers the parent, understandably. And I, I empathize and I connect with those parents that, that it brings up some of their deepest fears. But one of the best things is that I'm glad that they're talking about it. And once we know, then we can do things to help and support. And so when someone's in crisis, we want to make sure to treat them with respect, just like we would anybody else. Um, and then I want to listen. I wanna make sure that I'm hearing. So if the person is talking about difficulties at school, that's where validation becomes important because sometimes, especially with the parents that I work with, I teach, because sometimes the parent, you know, say, oh, that's not that bad, that, that that minimizes what that youth just said. And so instead we wanna reflect, we wanna say, oh, that must be hard. Thank you so much for sharing this with me. And sometimes I have to give them a script. Like we have to talk about here are things to say when your child comes and is maybe struggling with these, with these negative thoughts. And then I want to make sure that I give praise and acknowledge and encourage their, their progress, no matter how small and ignoring whatever, whatever flaws. So something that I, so I have a almost six-year-old and something that I've been saying since he was very small is everyone makes mistakes, everyone. Now we, we have consequences, we're, we're responsible for, for our behavior, but when he makes a mistake, I want him to know that, that he can come to me and that there's nothing too big, nothing that now like, I, I might be upset on the inside, but I would rather know and and um and then we we can I can help him problem solve or I can talk him through problem solving it. But um, making sure that that teens 
that kids have safe spaces to, to land. And I keep using the, the word safe because safety is a feeling. I can physically be safe and not feel safe. And, and the importance of emotional safety, I think that's that's incredibly important. And so, um, and then if you don't know the person, not initiating touch because I don't know their history, even if I do know them, um, I'm very careful with touch. I work with a lot of trauma survivors. And so if a client is needing touch in session, I often have a family member come in and the family member is the one that 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 does that, um, that is able to, to support the individual. And sometimes when somebody is in crisis, they don't want to be touched. And so being, being mindful of their physical, because they'll often... If somebody isn't isn't in a space to receive that, they might they might um, put up. And so some um, common observations: there might be a loss of hope. They might appear sad or desperate. That um, you could also see somebody appearing very anxious, fearful, or panicky. Sometimes difficulty concentrating can be a symptom of a lot of different things or that loss of control. And this is the one that I think gets overlooked, being angry or irritable, that that can sometimes be a sign of somebody that's in a stress response. And that might be, because sometimes I think we forget that fight is one of those stress, stress responses and that that can come up as being very angry and irritable. And so um, let's go ahead and go to the next one. And so uh, there is a um, there is a text line, the 988, and I think I updated that on a different one, but uh, it's awesome that they now have, because they used to have the 1-800-273-TALK, but there is now the just texting or calling 988 for somebody that, that is in crisis. There are a few other um, there's crisis text lines and for teens, I often find that they do better with um, texting in those in those moments um, because they um, often struggle with being able to um, with they often struggle with um, being able to to do that. Uh, so there are five action steps for helping someone in emotional pain. So one of the first steps is to ask. And I want to be specific because with warning signs of things like suicide, um, sometimes I think we get, we don't always ask, we don't always say the word. And so I need to ask, are you, are you thinking about harming yourself? Are you having thoughts of not wanting to be here? Being able to ask the question directly, um, that, that, that 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 can be incredibly important. Um, making sure to um, keep keep them safe. So we want to have that that safety plan in place. I'm glad that the industry moved away from like no harm contracts to more of safety plans. And a part of a safety plan is identifying what are the triggers, what are the ways that that the individual can, what are what are what coping do they already have, and then who who can they talk to, who can they reach out to. We want to be sure to be there and listen carefully and acknowledge their feelings, and then also help them connect by using those nine eight eight lines or um, any of those other, um, there's also a text hello to 741741. And I think that'll be on the, the updated slide, um, but, but making sure to check in to see, are they having these thoughts? So right now there's a bit of a crisis with youth and, um, and, and where individuals are not only having more of these thoughts, but sometimes they are sadly experiencing, um, they're actually dying by suicide. And so um, we want to, to take these things seriously. I work with parents and communities that when a child is having these types of thoughts, we want to be able to connect them with a licensed mental health professional where they can be able to get appropriate treatment. And um, because often these individuals are feeling hopeless and helpless, and there are treatments that are incredibly helpful that, that we can help them find a sense of purpose, help them live a life that's, that's worth living. And it's often identifying what some of those triggers and stressors are and, um, and addressing some of that pain, that pain without purpose can, 
that's just incredibly, but if we can address whatever that, that pain is, that that can often really be, be helpful. And so I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Frederica. Thank you, Dr. Barry, for sharing with us. Um, we do, we will make sure that when you receive your, uh, the PowerPoint that you receive will be the one that we updated. Um, so that last slide that Dr. Barry um, discussed that you have the most recent um, contact information if there is someone you know who's experiencing suicidal ideation um, and where you can get support. And that's a nation, uh, national number. Um, if you want to contact us, our contact information is there. We know that there's time for Q&A. And so we really want to uh, thank you all for joining us for this hour. We want to try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, and I just want to kind of um, wrap up our discussion and what you heard Dr. Berry discuss. Um, and she urged us as adults that when our young people come to us, that in fact, we will um, be able to speak to them in a way, even though emotionally inside, um, as we talk about our culture, um, understanding a person's culture, um, as a parent, as a guardian, that person may not be you, but that's the beauty of understanding a child's culture because it could be um, that priest, it could be um, that pastor, it could be that auntie. So again, when you understand culture and you understand community, that if you're not the person to help that youth that's experiencing serious mental illness, that there may be persons within that child's respective community that can come alongside you to uh, provide support. So now I guess we'll turn it over to Jackie who will give us direction uh, in terms of questions that have come through. Absolutely. First, just thank you so much, Dr. Brooks Davis and Dr. Barry for that presentation that was so informative. And um, I appreciate all of the, the consideration that you gave to us during this last hour. Um, and thank you to everyone who's been in the chat providing questions and resources as well. I saw some fantastic resources being posted in there too. So thank you everyone for, for joining us and engaging in that way. Um, I, I really want to dive into our, our q and I know we only have a few minutes left here, but if we can get a question or two in, that would be great. Um, first, I would just love, while um, both of you are working in these clinical settings, as many that are joining us also do, these considerations can go far beyond um, just the clinical office, as you know, into our communities, into our schools, into our home settings. Um, and so I just kind of want to uh, explore, and you had, you had mentioned how there's so many protective factors that, that cultural consideration is important for mental health, but there's also those, those challenges that it poses for, for people working in clinical settings, people working in communities and schools or at home if the culture is different. But how can therapists or clinicians and those working in these settings start to shift their mindset and recognize culture as this tool and real benefit for youth and their mental health rather than that, that challenge and barrier that needs to be overcome. I love that's what, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. I was gonna say, that's a great question, but it's a loaded one, Jackie, and we don't have enough time. <laughs> Right, because it's a whole other, other day. Yeah, that's, that's a whole, I guess what I would just suggest is whether or not we have had the experience where our culture was one that, um, where we felt marginalized or not. I think as clinicians and researchers who study and are supposed to understand those that we are seeing, that whether or not I personally believe culture matters really does not matter because it's not about me and my thought as a clinician, but it is about what's important to that client. And if I'm in a place where I don't understand or see that, perhaps I need to seek some peer support and supervision in that with someone who I can talk to, who I respect, 
who might be different. So Dr. Barry and I went to school together, but we have two separate lived experiences. So therefore, I can come alongside Dr. Barry and because I know I don't know everything, tell me about this experience and she can do the same, but I'll pass it to Dr. Barry to see what she'd like to add. Yes, and um, because I the way I heard the question is sometimes culture can be a resilience. It can be like a place of support for some individuals they might be experiencing because let's say they're not in an affirming church and I'm working with a gay male that can't come out to his parents because of their culture. I think still providing them with that safe space because often that individual still loves their family. They still, they still love their, their, so I don't want to put my thoughts on them because sometimes I think clinicians, we have to be careful to not think like, oh my gosh, like this is the worst thing. Or because sometimes I put, I have to make sure that I'm seeing things from the client's perspective. And um, so I, I have clients that I work with where their families are not emotionally safe, but it would destroy the client to not have a relationship with, with their family. And so we have to find, okay, how can we set some boundaries? How can we have an exit plan for when things do get too heated? Or so we talk about how can they honor that and still create emotional safety for themselves? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Barry. And, and thank you, Dr. Brooks Davis. I know that that was a big one to tackle in a very short time here. But I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on one more question before we wrap up our hour. Um, there have been a few questions coming in similar to this, and I'll try and wrap it into one. But for you who are maybe living in an area or in a home where their culture is different from those around them, um, and they might not feel that safety or know who to go to, what suggestions do you have to help them find that community and connection that we discussed is so important for their healing and their mental health? And, and that's a case where maybe finding an online community, because if it's something that is, um, they're in a small town and there's just not a mosque nearby that, that sometimes people can find online connections. Um, and then um, I think sometimes finding ways that their culture can be appreciated and celebrated if they are in a space where that's safe. Because there are some communities, there are some spaces where they can't safely do that. And, um, and so if it can be done safely, I think that can be really awesome. If it can't, then we have to, we have to think about other, other alternatives. And so sometimes online, I think can be an option. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I know we are right up at our hour, and I just want to say another huge thank you to Dr. Barry and Dr. Brooks Davis for being here with us and providing this great information. I'm going to hand it back over to Paige to just close us out, um, but thank you all again for being here. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you to both of our presenters. It was an amazing conversation and presentation. Uh, we will be sending out the recording and the slides um, and the certificate of attendance after the webinar. I sent that out in the chat. Uh, then we will also have a survey pop up in your window at the end of this presentation. And if you can complete that presentation, we would greatly appreciate your opinions and your feedback. But other than that, you all, uh, and I want to make sure that I thank SAMHSA again for sponsoring uh, this webinar. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. You all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. That does conclude today's event. You may now disconnect.